Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala şerefi l-enbiya ve mursalin Seyyidina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahabatihi ecma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'una ve fa'na bima alamtina ve zedna ilma. So we're on chapter 3. Strengthen your motivation and commit to change. Some of the topics we'll talk about in this chapter is the stages of change and how to motivate yourself. It starts on page 42 at the top. It says how we change. So psychologists have spent decades trying to understand the process of behavior change. And after a period of trial and error and evolution, they've come to this concept. One of the most well-studied theories, they say, is the trans-theoretical model of behavior change, which is essentially the stages of change. What what the, the psychologists and scientists wanted to understand was what happens inside the minds to motivate us to change our behaviors, especially behaviors that have been habits for a long period of time. So what's interesting about this is they, they talk about the stages of change. They talk about technical terms like pre-contemplation where people aren't thinking about change, contemplation where people are thinking about change, like, I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, preparation where people are now moving towards well, what can I do to change? Maybe calling a rehab, taking preparatory steps. And then action, which is now taking action to change. And then maintenance is like maintaining that change. So putting all those technical terms aside, what I found very interesting is that when Islam came and started the process of introducing the prohibition of intoxicants, it came down in stages and it was a gradual change. And it, it, it's, it's amazing how it understood the psychology of humans and people for that to happen. Because each ayah that came down tells a, a, whole, a huge story. But suffice to say for now, there was a gradual change and there were gradual stages in making that change. So the first ayah that came down was Yes, alunaka an al khamar wal maysir in Surah Al Baqarah. They ask you about wine and gambling. So, before I go into that, what it, what it talks about now is in the, on page 44, it says, the point of all this, right, thinking about the stages of change, is to figure out where you're at in that stage and then figure out what would it take to move you to the next stage of change so now here's the here's the interesting part they say that one of the most powerful things to help move people along that stage along the stages of change is creating a pros and cons list so on the bottom of page 44 and, and again this book is the recovery skills workbook it's not a individual person's opinions or anecdotal experience. Th that's helpful, but that's not what this is. This is somebody who's compiled all the latest and greatest evidence-based approaches to how to motivate, how to address addiction. So they talk about how on the bottom of page 44, consider the pros and cons of changing your alcohol or drug use as well as the reasons why it might be worth, uh, worth changing. And you'll get a better idea of how to answer that question. And so, and then on page 45, it talks about, this is what's, this is what, this is really interesting. It says, it is important to acknowledge that there were some positive rewards that you got out of drinking or using back when you started. So you would think like, okay, the pros and cons list, really the purpose of it is to highlight the cons because that's going to motivate you to, and that's what people do. They, they highlight the bad parts, like don't do this, don't do that. Uh, it, it, this is all the pain that it's causing, so on and so forth. But it, it goes on, right? And on the bottom of page 45, it says, being realistic about these short and long-term effects is important so that you can take an honest look at the full range of benefits and drawbacks that come with each possible decision such as continuing to drink to, or use versus changing your use patterns. 
So looking at both the pros and the cons. So the exercise that we go into in this chapter is basically you go into, you look at the pros of drinking and drugging. You look at the cons. Then you look at the cons and pros, the pros and cons of not drinking and drugging. So they go both ways. We'll go to it in a little bit. But the point I wanted to highlight here is, so the ayah comes down, right? The first ayah, when everybody's drinking in, in that society, when everybody's at the beginning stage, pre-contemplation stage, when they're not thinking about drinking or stopping drinking, the ayah comes down and it says, yes, alunaka and al khamar wal maysir. They ask you about intoxicants and gambling. And then it says, qul fihi ma ithmun kabir wa manafi'u linnas. Say, in them is a great harm and a benefit for the people. And the harm is better, is, is worse, is worse than the, the benefit. Okay, so now it's like, okay, so there's an acknowledgement that there's a benefit here and that there's a harm here. And this is how the dialogue and the conversation started. And there's a whole science in the in the ulum of Quran around the questions and answers in the Quran. So even in this same ayah, at the at the at the latter part of it, it says, Yes alunaka madha yunfiqun. Another, they ask you about what to spend. And Allah says, Qul al -af. So that spend the uh, the excess. Just one word. Whereas in the previous question, it's a long explanation. And so it's, it's, it's so fascinating. First of all, there's different ways that Allah could have answered the question. Like, you, you, uh, you know, they ask you about intoxicants. You can say so much about this. There's so much that can be said. So just in the way that Allah decides to respond, there's, a, there's you know, wisdom. And there's so much to, to take from that. And then uh, what, what he says. And there's a, there's, there's a going into length here in the explanation like this this could have been said in a different way it could have just said that the pros outweigh the cons or the the harm outweighs the benefits but the way allah says it is he doesn't say it like that he says there's uh, harms and there's benefits and then he repeats again the harms outweigh the benefits so, I, you know, it, it, there's so much wisdom in our deen, and there's so much that can be extrapolated. And inshallah, we'll go into the chapter, we'll just go into the text and go through it from front to back. But there's so much in our deen to teach us about recovery and the addiction problem and how to live a fulfilling and happy and peaceful life. And, and that's the trick, to use Islam to be this healing force this loving force and not have it simply be the get this feeling of it just reminding us of how much we're a disappointment or being this harsh critical no there's so much here Th that's not how Allah started this conversation in the Quran so let me pause and let some people in so it starts off on page uh, 41 on chapter 3. The first sentence is, is great. It says, have you ever wondered why it is that you can feel entirely convinced one day that drinking and or using is something that has become toxic in your life? It's something you would swear off or even you can't even conceptualize ever doing it again. Yet the next day or even the next hour, you can find yourself coming up with reasons why it might be okay to drink or use just one more time. And this is probably one of the most fascinating things about addiction to me, whether it be drug addiction, pornography addiction, behavioral addictions, they all share this feature in common, whether it be quote unquote hard drugs like heroin or other drugs like prescription opioids, which are essentially also hard. And uh, what's interesting is, is 
I have this unique opportunity of seeing people when they have this period of time sober, like a short period of time. So I see people when they're in the hospital, they come to the hospital, they have three, four, five days uh, sober in the hospital. They had an infection that brought them to the hospital or something happened where they came, they had an injury or a car accident or intoxicated, come to the hospital. They're in the hospital for four or five days. They have a huge reason not to use and they're convinced they'll, they won't use again. And, you know, I can see it in their eyes and I know the feeling. They're, they're just convinced they will never use again. And then we, we, we work with them and our peer mentors follow up with them. And then a day or two, they're using again. And, and I really do believe that, that addiction, we're convinced that how can we, after a consequence like this, even think about using again? But that thin line between I'll never use again and how can I go in my whole life without using? The thin line between I'll never use again and I can't go the rest of my life without using is one of the most fascinating things about addiction to me. And it really also highlights the, the irrational aspect of it that those thoughts are in a lot of ways just signals that we don't necessarily have to believe both of them that I'll never use again is an irrational thought and that I can't go the rest of my life without using that's also an irrational thought and we don't have to necessarily entertain either of those so this is this is probably one of the most fascinating things about addiction it's also a great leveler everybody with addiction goes through this, this experience regardless of uh, you know what background like all of us are all from different backgrounds and despite that we can all share in that experience and 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 um and relate to that on some on, on, on different levels and so when you understand that as the essential understanding of addiction that one moment you could be really motivated next moment not then then the question is well how do we strengthen our motivation and commit to change and that's the name of this chapter so it says in the second paragraph in this chapter you are going to learn about why your motivation to change important behaviors might shift around from day to day and then it talks about different stages of motivation to change your use of alcohol and drugs and then they start getting into some practical stuff like exercises um, You'll, you'll do a self-assessment to get a, ses a sense of where you're at and your motivation and commitment. And you can revisit the exercise anytime you need a little bit of a psychological boost. So then it goes to the next chapter talking about how the best theory that psycholo psychologists have been able to come up with is the stages of change. And there's five stages. So I'm going to go, go over them in a little bit more depth now. And, and the important part to understand about these five stages are no matter where you're at in the cycle, you can move back and forth between these stages. So basically it's like the stages start from pre-contemplation, which is, I don't even want to talk about my drug and alcohol use. That's pre-contemplation. Like, I don't even want to talk about it. And then the last stage, which is I'm recovered and I'm just trying to maintain it. So the first stage that I talk about is pre-contemplation. And then they talk about how, you know, if you're, if you're picked up this workbook and you're working on it, you're probably not in the pre-contemplation phase. Then the next stage is contemplation. And again, although, you know, many of us might not be here, it's still good to get an idea of this stage because when we relapse or when we see people that kind of dwell with us for a little bit and then they relapse, they're going back to that perhaps at times they're going back to that pre-contemplation stage. So then the second, second stage is contemplation. And this is where people think maybe I need to make some changes or maybe drinking or drugging isn't good for me anymore. Or maybe I can't control this addiction anymore. And then uh, the next stage is preparation. Preparation is where you start exploring ways that you can get help. So if somebody like calls a rehab, but not necessarily committed to getting in, that's preparation. Action is when you've started treatment. 
and maintenance is uh, just being consistent. They defined it as being maintenance as being in the action stage for about six months or longer. So the process of recovery from addiction is different for each person. And a slip or a relapse can naturally interrupt your life and the progression through these stages, but it doesn't have to put you right back where you started. If you catch yourself early, you can catch a slip before it turns into a full-blown relapse. And you can get right back into the action phase. So this is about your commitment to change, your motivation. It's not about if you use drugs or alcohol, or if you looked at pornography one more time or gambling, it's about where you're at in terms of either continuing in the ring or not. And so, so if you can actually go from a relapse right back or, or a use of drugs and alcohol right back into the action phase, uh, as opposed to winding back up into an earlier phase and getting stuck there. So the question, the exercise 3.1 talks about what stage are you in? And they ask on a scale of one to 10, what stage are you, what, how motivated are you? So zero being not motivated to 10 being highly motivated. And this is something to constantly check in with about yourself. Like how motivated am I right now? It's something that's really good to, you know, forget about how we look on the outside. Like we're going to meetings, we're, you know, work, everything sort of looks good internally. This is like an internal gauge where you can ask yourself, like, how motivated am I really to continue to do the work of recovery or change? And this will kind of give you a gauge of, okay, maybe I'm at a five today. And so now you can say, I'm at a five. Well, what do I have to do to get to a six, seven, eight, nine, ten? And that's what the exercises in, in this chapter are there to help us do. So in the in the third paragraph of page forty four, it talks about what would it take for me to just move up one more point on the scale. And then it talks about the very important exercise of considering your pros and cons of changing your alcohol or drug use, and the reasons why it might be worth changing. Before it goes into that, it goes into another section called ambivalence. Ambivalence is like a technical term, which is having mixed feelings about using or not using. So ambivalence means being too minded about something. This is a really important concept. You kind of want to change. It's not working for you anymore. It's, it's causing a lot of problems, but then it's kind of like a warm blanket. We're kind of comfortable in this state, in this place. There's reasons for me to continue doing it. And there's reasons for me not to continue doing it. This is called ambivalence. To understand this and recognize this is really important because what you don't want to do is pretend like that's not occurring. Because all that does is it still operates through you just in like a clandestine, hidden, you know, top secret manner. It's working through you subconsciously. So what you want to do is acknowledge your motivation to change. Acknowledge if you're feeling two ways about something. So that, that happens in early recovery. It also happens like six months in, a year in, a year and a half in, where you start thinking about where you can get too minded about things again. That using no longer seems like that big of a deal. I got a stable job now. I could probably just use on the weekends or every other weekend or just to unwind or, you know, once every two months when my spouse is away at, at their thing. Um, so once we start minimizing the substance use or the problems associated with that, or once we start becoming too minded about things again, that's when it's a warning sign that things are, are not working in our favor and that it's, it's a warning sign to do something about it. And that's what this chapter talks about. It talks about motivation as a warning sign and it talks about ambivalence as a warning sign. So let's say you do the motivation zero through 10 thing and you say, look, I'm a five. I've been at a five for the last week. Now it's time to start 
like digging deeper on how do we go to a 10? Or let's say you start getting really too minded about your use. Like you want to stay sober, but then thoughts keep coming back as to kind of wanting to not. And so when, when that happens, then that's where it's a signal to start working on these exercises to improve your motivation. With that being said, we're going to talk about this really important exercise, and then we're just going to wrap up. I don't want to make this as long as last week. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think, I don't have a feeling like we need to go a chapter at a time. I feel like we should just go until, because some of this stuff is denser than, than other parts. And um, once I start feeling like it's getting a little too dense, I'm, I, I think we should just stop, and then we should just open it up for questions and check-ins. So, but this is a really important exercise. This is a hack. This isn't one of those things that you may come across immediately. Um, it's a pros and cons list. And I'm going to tell you how to do it and how I've uh, learned it from people. You create a pros and cons list on the left side. So you get a piece of paper. Like you, you literally do the exercise, not in your head. So you get a piece of paper. So I got mine right here. On the left side, you write the pros of using substances. On the right side, you write the cons of using substances. So why do we need this? We've been sober for a couple months. Some of us have been sober for longer than that. This is a good exercise to enhance motivation to continue to move forward when, time, when, times, get, when times get tough. Not if times get tough, when they do. So pros would be the pros of, of using substances. So this is where you want to be honest about what it does for you. And there's a purpose for it. So let's say, let's just write a couple down. Stress reliever, you guys can throw some out if you want. Stress reliever, um, fun, kills boredom. Grief. Yeah. Yeah. I, antici I anticipated you. That's why. I yeah. Anxiety. Yeah. I mean, that th those last two or three are, are really good ones. Um, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. It's what might have brought us to use or what our pros and cons list was right before we had our, our recent bout of sobriety might not necessarily be our pros and cons list now. Uh, like the pros and cons of using substances three months ago before I got into rehab and then I got three months sober and where I'm at right now, the pros and cons list might be different. Like there might be other pros to using that bump up to the top of my list. Um, okay, so then the cons of using that, let's say jails, institutions, death, the fear of death, overdose, um, you know, we can go on and on. This is the part that might come a little bit more easy to people. And this is the part where people might focus on more. But it's important to focus on both. Now, there's a second part of this. This is important, which is the pros and cons of not using substances. So being sober, the pros and cons of being sober. So saving up money is a pro. Um, family not being upset with us so on and so forth the cons of not using so here's where people say this might be redundant but it's not it's an important part of the exercise and the reason what why it's so helpful is because it helps you process the problem from a different angle it may not hit you when you think about the pros and cons of of using but you may get a motivational boost from, let's say, the, co the cons of, of not using. 
or the pros of not using. So what I would encourage you to, to go through that exercise and to really get this solidified in your mind and to write it down. So two more points I want to make about this. Number one, the pros of using drugs and alcohol, that pros list, part of the reason why that's so important to, to record is because now that pros list is a list of things that we need to find alternatives for. So if one of the pros of using was grief, we need to find a really good alternative to manage grief because we will have another loss, financially, relationship, uh, um, legal, it'll, there'll be something. If it's anxiety, we need to find another alternative for anxiety. Exercise, mindfulness, therapy, spirituality, whatever it be, but we gotta do it uh, as a priority. And stress relief, fun, finding other ways to enjoy life. So the pros list is really important. The pros of using substances is also very important. And the cons of using substances is obviously important. But then the pros of not using substances is how we enhance the, our life, our sober life, the areas that we look at to continue to enhance to make a sober life worth it for us. So if it's the fact that if being sober is great because my family's happy with me, then we continue to enhance connecting with family, spending more time with them, so on and so forth. And then the cons of not using, again, is, is let's say if the cons of not using, let's say that's boredom. Let's say that's, um, old friends again that's another list for us to identify replacements that we need to bring in our life so we need to find other ways to deal with boredom and maybe we're bored because we're boring so we need to find ways to make life fun with what we have at the moment or old friends perhaps what we need to do is work on new connections so with drugs and alcohol, friends, you know, a, a lot of times there's a lot of intense feelings and experiences that create like bonding between people. When you're, when you're living life fast and you're at war, sometimes you develop these bonds. And so in recovery, it's important to, sometimes it can feel like that's missing. Even if things got kind of, um, uh, even if, you know, people started turning against each other, perhaps at the end, or, or there's other conflicts that happen at the, end, at the end, building those bonds are really important in recovery. And finding other people who are in recovery can be a really great way to build those bonds. And it, it might just take time. So it's good to start making that investment. Relationships take time and investment. And the great part about this is we can choose who we invite in our life. So with that, we'll, we'll stop today. And then we will go ahead and um, why don't we start with questions? Yeah, that's a good question. So this being an exercise that we do now momentarily, and how do we use this for the long term? How do we make this a tool that we can use for the long term? So one suggestion that I came across which I found a really fantastic suggestion is to create a pros and cons list and keep it with you, like in your wallet. And then you can keep it with you wherever you need it and pull it out when you need a motivational boost because it reminds you of the reasons of why you use, but then it'll also remind you of your reasons of why you don't want to use. So it'll motivate you to not using but then it'll also help remind you of like, what is going on with me right now? What are the usual suspects that are driving me back to wanting to use? So if you look at your list and you get a boost from, I'm doing this for you know family, I'm doing this to have a better life, I'm doing this to stay out of jail, I'm doing this for whatever reasons. And then you also look at the other side and you say, okay, I usually use because I'm bored or I usually use because of loneliness or I usually, then you can say, well, what's going on in my life right now that I want to use? Which one of these things 
is it? And then another point, another um, tip that I came across, which is really excellent, is write your pros and cons list on something, an image that's incredibly motivating to you. So let's say you're in a custody battle and it's your child and it's this is your motivating factor. Then take a picture of your kid and make your pros and cons list on the back of that. Maybe it's a particular job or goal or dream that you have. Put your uh, pros and cons list on the back of that. Maybe it's just kind of not wanting to go back to jail in prison and that's gotten so sick and tired you just you've gotten so sick and tired of that put it on the back of something like that uh like a letter that you got in jail of something terrible happening while you were there that you know something that's going to motivate you and so that's a really great question and that's um that's something that i think is a great tool any other questions One more thing I wanted to go over is uh, real quick Narcan training. This is Narcan. It's the antidote for opioids. So this is the part that goes in your nose and you hold it just like this. You press this button to spray. A mist comes out of this way. A mist comes out this way. This is used to reverse an opioid overdose. Opioids are heroin, fentanyl, prescription oxys, perks, uh, and, uh, you know, opioids. So this is what reverses an overdose. You can always get prescriptions for this and, uh, you can get this at other places as well. All right. So first, how do you recognize an overdose? Number one is the definition of an overdose an opioid overdose is depressed breathing. So people will be struggling to breathe. It can look like bluish discoloration around the lips or bluish fingernail beds or their breathing is just really so suppressed you're, you're even trying to struggle to figure out if they're breathing or not or it could be no breathing and then and then nothing for a while so it's it's suppressed breathing or struggling breathing and usually people are passed off uh, passed out overwhelmingly people are passed out when this happens you can't wake them up you can't arouse them Okay, so what, when you suspect an opioid overdose, you give Narcan. The way you give it is you hold it just like that. This is, this, is, this is how you press it. You put it directly in their nose and you press the button. You don't want to waste it by trying it out first to see if it works and then put it in the nose. Just put it directly in the nose and press it. And then it coats the inside of the nose and then that, that'll uh, bring the person back. Now, when you administer it, you want to call 911 right away. So you don't want to administer it and then, you know, call 911 later because this doesn't last. This may wear off and then the opioids overdose the, the person again. They go back into an overdose. You want to give this and then you want to call 911 right away. And then when this wears off, they can give the permanent antidote. Um, so that that's really important. You don't want to just give this and think that everything's finished and the problem solved. You want to give this and call 911. The second point is that once you give this, you give it about a minute. Give it about a minute. If it's not, if they're not waking up, give another dose. You give it another minute, not waking up, you give another dose. Okay. So because with fentanyl now, fentanyl being so strong people oftentimes may need more doses in order to get an effect. They give a dose, call 911, and go from there. If they're having trouble breathing, you can do some rescue breaths. What that means is just sealing their mouth with your mouth. They'll be on their back. You seal your mouth with their mouth and give them some breaths. You can pinch their nose, lift their chin, and give them a breath or two every second. And that's just important to know. Obviously, if you are have the overdose, you're not going to be able to do this to yourself, but you can save somebody else. And then if you're in a tough spot, you just want to keep Narcan on you uh, in your pocket. 
Okay, let's wrap up here and then we'll do some check-ins.